Well, good morning, Bridgeway. How is everybody this morning? So good to see you guys. If you're joining us online, welcome this morning. We're going to start, as we always do, with some worship to our risen King. So would you stand as we sing together? I was buried beneath my sin. Who could carry the kind away? It was my turn till I made you. I was breathing, but not. Alive. All my failures I try to hide It was my turn Till I made you You call my name Rachel on up for some announcements today. Good morning, everyone. Um, so if you are new, um, you can scan the QR code on the back of your seats or in the flyers there. Um, we donate $10 to a Child's Hope International for every communication card that a guest fills out, which feeds, um, $10 feeds a child for an entire month. 
We still have the diaper drive for Joel and Meg Ring. We're coming to a close on that here soon. Where is she? I don't know, but she's, she's close. Yes, there she is. <laughs> um, so if you have any of those, you can leave those at the guest services table. And Bridgeway Kids Ministry teacher, uh, we already had that, so just, just kidding. That's on you. That's not just kidding. <laughs> um, marriage small group, that started today, I believe. Um, but if you still wanna join, still scan the QR code to sign up. Any information, um, that is Andrew and Christy Cole, if you wanna reach out to them. And then our youth revival, that is this coming Friday and Saturday, October 18th and 19th at Sardinia Church of Christ. It's $15. Um, that will get you in for the whole weekend. Um, so Friday evening and then all day Saturday. So if you guys wanna come, just reach out to me. That's for middle school and high schoolers, by the way. And so the decorate and do good, um, there is a code Bernie, right? Code, Bernie is the code. Um, to get a discount for those, um, that's also Andrew Cole and um, Cooper, wherever he is. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then Bridgeway Fall Festival, um, Saturday, October 26th, five, nope, Tommy, yes. Come on up, Tommy, yes. <laughs> Come on down. Hi. Hi, is everybody? Good morning. Wow, you guys aren't, sh aren't playing and singing and jumping and dancing. I'm usually in there, if you don't know me, I'm the children's director. Fall Festival is Saturday, October 26th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. It's preschool to fifth grade. This is a family event. This isn't a drop your kid off and run away event. This is uh, for all of you guys, all the families. So it's a hangout with your kids. There'll be food, there'll be games, there'll be a barrel train, um, there'll be just a whole lot of fun. You come in and, and we'll start it off in here with some music and um, just uh, to explain how everything goes and then we'll send you off. There'll be crafts and so on and so forth. We need you guys to pre-register. Uh, when you pre-register, it's a simple registration. Um, only just let us know how many people in your family are going. That way we know how much food we need. Um, Again, it's Saturday, October 26th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And then, oh, I didn't know about this. Third annual chili cook-off, family worship, October 20th at 5 p.m. That will be here at church. That sounds amazing. And then new service layout starting November 3rd. Brent will explain that. But, yeah, that's it. And then we have someone coming up. Uh, yes, I, I, um, Jose and Christy, uh, many of you probably probably already know them and their beautiful family because uh, they've been here for a little while. Jose, you guys can come on up. Um, but what you may not know is Jose and Christy are also missionaries uh, with family life. So uh, Jose and, and Christy are going to say a, a few, few words about their ministry. Good morning. We are so excited that Bridgeway is a church that sends missionaries. We could not do what we do without the faithful prayers and giving of individuals, families, and churches. Sometimes we feel like the boy in John 6 who gave his fish and his bread to Jesus, and Jesus did something amazing with it. With you, we give our time, our talents, our treasures, our prayers to the Lord, and he does something amazing with it. Thank you for partnering with us in the gospel. We, we give to the Lord trusting that he will reach families for Christ. We give to the Lord trusting that he will reach the nations for Christ. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing. Good morning. As, as the pastor mentioned, we work with a ministry called Family Life, and we do it because we love families. Uh, what we, we believe about families is short, Boys are boys, girls are girls. Life start, uh, begins at the conception. Uh, femininity is beautiful, masculinity is not toxic. It's what we believe. Maybe you are not agree. If you, are, uh, you disagree, you can contact Pastor Brandon, invite him for a coffee and talk about it. Uh, we lunch, lunch or dinner. What, what do you prefer? Either, either way, lunch or dinner, you can invite him and talk about this. Uh, 
So yeah, we are missionaries with Family Life, and we talk about Jesus with people, basically. That's simple. How? Uh, we have different ways to contact people. One is through phone calls. We have different plat platforms, and they contact us. For example, some, uh, some weeks ago, maybe you hear about speaking in tongues. Easy, easy. Don't, don't be scared. Uh, that day, I experienced listening in tongues. I talked with a guy, he's deep, uh, he's live, uh, living deep in Louisiana. So he has a really thick southern accent. Really thick. And when I was on the phone with him, I understood every, every word. So I, I was proud of myself. <laughs> and he was looking for a men's group. So I started looking, we were looking at the map. No men's group in, in his area. The closest men's group it was in Texas. Uh, so I told him, you know what? There is no men's group. You need to start one. You're going to be the first one. And he said, no, there is no way. I, I, I'm not going to do it. He said, you can, you can have your own men's group. He was hesitant. And he finally started a, a small group for men. We contact people other ways through e e email. We have different platforms. They contact us. Some weeks ago, I was talking uh, first email, uh, through email, a uh, phone call with a couple where they are missionaries in somewhere in, in Africa. And they want to start, uh, they, were, they have been missionaries in Africa for 25 years but they never ministered to families. So they contact us, I was talking with them, and they are somewhere in Africa, and they want to start a family group in Morocco. So I, I was smiling at the end of this phone call because I was thinking how God took a Mexican guy, moved him to Amelia, Ohio, to talk with a couple who is in Africa who is going to coach a small group in Morocco. Only God can do that. I mean, God is good networking. Uh, and the other way to contact people is just, just going. Just going uh, with people and talking. They, um, days ago, here in Cincinnati, I was helping uh, with the distribution of food for, for some poor families. Uh, I started talking with a, with a lady. Uh, but it wasn't just the food. I wanted to talk with her to know her story. Uh, she is from Mexico. And she's from, she's from Chiapas, the state of Chiapas. And I don't know if you know, but in, in Mexico, you can die if you are a Christian some parts. Chiapas is one of these, these places you can die. Uh, so she told me her story. Uh, she shared with me that uh, she and her husband, they have a small business. Uh, because the corruption and the narco, the drug dealers, they, they asked for money. They said no. Uh, so they kidnapped the husband, they tortured, tortured the husband. Uh, they spill acid in the arms of the husband. Some of this acid spilled in uh, his eyes. Uh, so I was talking with her and she said, do you know where I can get glasses for my husband? because he cannot see, his, his vision is really bad. Told him, you know, your husband needs more than glasses. He needs a doctor, medical. It's not just with glasses. But she was, she just came, like, she has been here for two weeks. She had to escape. Um, so I thought, uh, well, I know some doctors. They, they can assist you. And after that, 
we can help you to get some glasses for you. But this is a process, you need to go through this process. And she was amazed. And she told me, when was the first time somebody helped me? In months. So what we do, we talk with people. We mourn with people. And we help in spiritual and material level. That's what we do. So we are thankful with, uh, with this church. We send the missionaries to the field. Uh, I, we always say it's, it's not a, just a phrase. It's really, we really believe it. We, we, we not go by ourselves. Bridge way go and reach people. And as I mentioned, it's not just here in Cincinnati or this area. It's all the country and around the world. Only God can do that. Reach people through the nation. And he is doing that. I want to finish saying this. God is working. Don't believe what the news say. If you want to watch news, it's okay. It's picture poison. But God is working. Those are the good news. God is doing a lot. And thank you for, because you are part of this. Thank you. Well, amen. We're so thankful for their ministry and to have them, uh, their beautiful family, as a part of the church here. We're going to pray and then we'll continue in our worship. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today and so thankful for uh, people like Jose and Christy and who are out there uh, in the trenches reaching people for you, Father God. And uh, we just uh, we just pray that you would uh, you would give us all uh, uh, give us all eyes to see people as you do. Father God, just let us not all forget that, uh, that they have stories, and, and, and Lord, that you are you are bigger than their past, and, and Lord, that uh, everyone is, is worth reaching uh, with the gospel, Father God. Lord, we just uh, we just lay everything at your feet and give you all the honor and glory. Amen. Would you stand as we continue our sins?
We'd like to uh, share a new song with you guys. You guys may be seated. It's called The Lion, or The Lamb, The Lion, The King. And um, we'll sing it over the next couple of weeks with you guys, but we're going to uh, debut it to you today. If you know the words, please sing along. That's beautiful. All right. Well, we're going to be in the Gospel of John to start off today, but today will be a little bit of a uh, different uh, sermon. Um, 
<sighs> We're going to talk some politics today. Oh, okay. I thought I'd give some booze there. All right. I did, it wasn't the route I was planning on going. I feel led we need to do this. Uh, and um, let's see how it goes. So I haven't spoken on politics in six years for a sermon. So it's not like if you're visiting, you're like, well, we picked a great day to visit, you know. Um, and that's something we talk about every single Sunday here at Bridgeway. Typically, we're just walking through a book of the Bible verse by verse. Uh, but today, uh, since, since early voting starting in, in Ohio, actually uh, last week, um, I feel this is something needful to talk about. But let's pray and then we'll dive in, okay? Let's bow together, church. God, we thank you for this time we have together today. Uh, I'm grateful for what we've experienced so far, Lord, being able to sing to you and um, hearing from the Sanchez family. We're grateful for how you're using them to further your gospel. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your word as we get to open it up today. And I pray as a church, we just continue to, to keep a spirit of unity, even maybe in areas where we may disagree, Lord, because ultimately what we want to do is point people to Jesus. And so uh, I pray that uh, you'd open our hearts and our ears to, to hear from you and to apply uh, what we learn. I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. <clears throat> so if you've got your Bible, if you need a Bible, just throw your hand up. They've got some in the back. If you need a Bible, don't have one or you forgot it. It'll also be on the screen if you need that as well. We've got that covered. John chapter 17, this is, uh, John chapter 17 is really the Lord's Prayer. I know we have a traditional Lord's Prayer where Jesus is teaching people to pray, but this is where Jesus is praying for us. And so you could call it the Lord's Prayer if you'd like. Uh, he says this, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through, your, through, through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. It's beautiful, isn't it? You get a, a sense that Jesus wants us to be unified and uh, churches should be in unity in, in the cause of Christ. Unity doesn't necessarily mean uniformity. Um, you know, as Christians, we're, we're good at disagreeing about some things. I don't know if we're good at disagreeing about things. Uh, Christians disagree. And that's part of the reason we have, you know, a bunch of different denominations too, right? Um, I mean, for the independent fundamental Baptists, we were too independent for them. So, you know, now we're, we're Southern Baptists. But um, when I think of differences within the church, um, Bridgeway, we, we, we're also kind of a, an interdenominational church. You know, we've got different denominations represented uh, in this group of believers, which I, I, I think it kind of makes us unique in some respect. Uh, you know, we've got folks with backgrounds in the Pentecostal or Catholic or Lutheran or Presbyterian um, or the Vineyard. Like, we, we've got uh, a broad spectrum here. Where we are united around Jesus Christ. So uh, we're, we're a bit of a colorful bunch here. Maybe we're just a church for all the rejects from the other denominations. I don't know. But at least we can be rejected together, okay? Um, Christians argue about music style sometimes or you know, tattoos and suits and jeans and this kind of stuff. Um, we need to be united about the gospel. And so we, we might even be divided over some political things. And I want to start off with just saying, like, um, our mission always stays the same, no matter what uh, political affiliation you have. Um, we, we know what we're here to do ultimately is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm grateful, again, for the, the diversity of our church. Um, people who don't agree with you on politics aren't your, your enemy. I, I know it's a very polarizing moment in our, um, in our country, but we, 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 our, our main um, enemy is not each other. Ephesians 6 lays it out perfectly. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we're not each other's enemy, okay? So let's just 
start off there. And, and the enemy would, uh, Satan would love to steal the unity within our churches and, and destroy the credibility of the church. Bridgeway is not a, a Republican church or a Democrat church or a Libertarian church, though uh, all three of those parties are probably represented in some respect um, within the body here. Um, uh, I'm a pastor for Democrats, Republicans, you know, across the board. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to treat you any, any different. You know, one of the uh, sweetest ladies to walk through uh, the doors of our church years ago was a lady by the name of Ruth Grant. Does anybody remember Ruth? A few of you do. Yeah. This was back in our chapel days. And uh, Ruth and I disagreed uh, pretty much on everything politically. But uh, one thing I knew about Ruth is I knew she loved me. And one thing she knew about me is she knew I loved her. And we both loved this church. And we both cared for each other. And so when Ruth got ill and was in the nursing home, we'd go and we'd spend time with Ruth. And I was able to preach Ruth's funeral. And Ruth is in heaven now. And uh, I will see her again. And you know, we disagreed on some things. And we still loved each other. We still cared for each other. And so what I speak about today, you might disagree with me. And I might disagree with you. And I want to say, listen, that's okay. I still love you. I'm still your pastor. You know, um, don't, don't let something that, uh, uh, like politics, destroy your relationship with other believers, okay? So I'm not, I'm not going to fall into that, uh, that trap, all right? So, and you shouldn't either, okay? So if you find out someone has a different political stance than you, uh, in this body of believers, okay, great. Be able to disagree with one another. Um, the reason I bring up some politics from the pulpit is many issues we are challenged with today are biblical issues, right? Many issues that we are faced today are, are, are biblical in nature, things about the family affecting children, sexual ethics, and so on. And so I think it's important to address those from a biblical Viewpoint. Now, maybe some of you are like saying, well, Brent, hold on a second. What about the separation of church and state? I mean, you're not supposed to be doing this kind of stuff, and uh, that's not right. In fact, uh, we live in the Georgetown area, and there's a big billboard that says, build the wall between church and state. And um, it's a misconception to say that this is something that's uh, necessarily in the, the Constitution. The idea of separation of church and state actually goes back to a minister, a Puritan guy by the name of Roger Williams. And Roger Williams uh, wrote about building a, a, a high wall between the uh, government and the state. He said to keep the wilderness of governments out of the affairs of religion. So essentially what he wanted, he did not want the government telling churches what to do. And it's been kind of reversed today. People are like, well, we're afraid churches are going to try to tell government what to do. And uh, I'll, I'll stop you right there. One, I think Christians need to have an influence politically. What we're not asking for is a theocracy, okay? We're not asking for theocracy because... There's only one theocracy that will work, and it's when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Okay, that's the only theocracy that works. So we're not asking for that necessarily. Now, uh, maybe some folks would, would view what I'm saying today as uh, I'm a Christian nationalist. I, I don't even know exactly what that means. I know there are a lot of labels that get thrown out there. Uh, Christian nationalist, so on and so forth. I am a Christian. Yes, I'm proud to be an American as well. Um, if you view Christian nationalists as someone who cares more about politics than they do about the gospel, then yeah, I don't want to be one of those. In fact, if people know more about your politics, more than they know about your faith, then something is probably a little askew there. You need to be bold about your faith. And uh, yes, have political input, have a political opinion. But when you look at the Bible, there's plenty of uh, issues politically that are addressed, especially in the Old Testament. But even in the New Testament, John the Baptist was viewed more as a political figure than, than Jesus was. That's why Josephus, the Roman historian, writes about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, uh, it's kind of why John gets killed. 
You know, he tells Herod, hey, it's not good for you to have your brother's wife. Like, dude, what are you doing? And he calls them out. And ultimately, they arrest John and cut his head off. Jesus, when he's talking about the government, you know, we talk about render to Caesars with Caesars, what's God's, what's God's. And then we also see in the New Testament that we're, you know, to pray for our leaders. I hope you prayed for Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. We've taken some time to pray for him. If you feel like you can't pray for that person, then you're doing something wrong. I mean, if you view the political candidates as your enemy, okay, Jesus told you to pray for them too, okay? So I hope you're praying for them. And um, uh, I don't wanna go continue to go about this. As Christians, it is important for you to be active politically. And you can do this a lot of different facets. <clears throat> Even if I wasn't a Christian, I would still vote. Part of my conviction when it comes to voting is that, um, you know, it is a privilege and it is a responsibility because we have this freedom to have a say in who leads our government. You know, family members of mine have fought in wars and I feel like I kind of owe it to them. They fought to preserve this country. And so it's important to let your voice be heard. And as a Christian, um, Christians, if you're not politically involved, if it, it, I'll quote uh, Josh Howerton. and I gleaned some things from him and uh, Gary Hamrick and several, several other pastors in studying for this. He said this, he said, if godly people won't lead their nation, godless people will. If godly people won't lead their nation, godless people will. So if godly people will not get involved in the political process, then you are saying that you are fine with ungodly people being the ones in charge of the political process. And that's wrong. So, uh, Proverbs 29, when the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. I think that's on the screen up there. Brandon, yeah, here we go. All right, now you know what the verse is. When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. There are 90, now I take this number for what it's worth. There are 90 million evangelical Christians in America. Now, is that a set number? I don't know. But in the last election, 40 million of those who could, of those 90 million, those who could vote, 40 million didn't vote in the last election. 15 million weren't even registered to vote. So millions of Christians sat out the last election. Don't come up to me and complain about the state of things in the nation if you're not even willing to take time to vote. Christians, you gotta vote. It's a, a responsibility that you have. And if you don't, shame on you, seriously. We have this privilege, this right. Other, other nations, people in other nations would love to have that. And as Christ ambassadors, your voice needs to be heard. It's a duty, a responsibility, and you should be informed about the issues in which you're voting. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And the reason I'm doing this, I, I kind of liken it to Ezekiel 33. If you take a look, um, Ezekiel 33 says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, speak to your people and tell them, suppose I bring the sword against a land and the people of the land select a man from among them, appointing him as their watchman. And suppose he sees a, the sword coming against the land and blows his ram's horn to warn the people. Then if anyone hears the sound of the ram's horn but ignores the warning and the sword comes and takes him away, his death will be his own fault. Since he heard the sound of the ram's horn but ignored the warning, his death is his own fault. If he had taken the warning, he would have saved his life. However, suppose the watchman sees the sword coming but doesn't blow the ram's horn so that the people aren't warned. The sword comes and takes away their lives. Then they have been taken away because of their iniquity. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. And so uh, many, many cities, especially the walled cities, had watchmen to warn of, of incoming danger. And it was their responsibility to pay close attention and to tell people, hey, the danger is on its way. And what I'm saying as a pastor, as an overseer of this church, um, as a watchman, it's important for me to say, like, you guys need to be involved in this process. 
If you care about the future of your country and you care about the state of affairs of your country, then you've got to do something. You've got to vote. So um, I'm going to give you three things to consider and we'll just go from there. First one I already talked about, voting is a right, um, but it's also a responsibility. Early voting's already started here in Ohio. If you, you're like, man, I don't want to go to the polls and it'd be incredibly busy and so on and so forth, then go vote early. That's what I'm going to do. I don't want to be around a massive crowd of people for, for that on election day. Um, so first thing is voting is not just a right, it's a responsibility. Two, I want you to keep something in mind. God uses flawed people. All right? Everyone that's ever ran for president uh, have been flawed people. And, and sometimes you have uh, good, good candidates who, who mess up. Sometimes you have bad candidates who might do some good things or vice versa. Um, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, you've got David, who was a man after God's own heart, and he wasn't perfect. He messed up. Hezekiah, not the greatest with foreign policy. Uh, but King Nebuchadnezzar and King Cyrus, they did some good things for Israel. And those weren't always necessarily the greatest guys either. And so I get it. As you're looking at these, these options that you have, um, if your criteria is I have to like this person 100%, uh, that's not realistic. If you've got to agree with them 100%, that's not realistic. I mean, how many things in your life do you have to like 100% to be a part of? I would say we don't even like Bridgeway 100%. I, I hope it's like you know, 99.9%, but maybe you come here because you like the music or the kids' programs or maybe the preacher, I don't know. But um, <laughs> I got a laugh on that. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Anyways, uh, 100%, we're not, we're not going to check all the boxes for you. I mean, the thing about this, is your wife perfect, Ben? Oh, oh, 100%. <laughs> Husband of the year right there. Andy also teaches our uh, young married class, and, um, you know, he's lying to them. So, <laughs> you know, your spouse isn't perfect. Your husband's not perfect. They're not perfect, um, but you married them. Not, not everything has to be 100%, okay? And I will say, uh, likability is not a great metric to vote, okay? If you're, you're basing it off of whether or not I like this person as a person, I don't think that's the greatest metric to, to vote for. Uh, I think there are better metrics that are involved. Um, you know, uh, how do I want to put this? Neither, yeah, carefully, <laughs> neither candidate would be in leadership at Bridgeway, you know, um, they wouldn't. Well, then why would you vote for one for president? Because it's, it's this different setting. The government is not the church, okay? So what I would encourage you to do is to vote for policies over personalities. The media really loves to push personalities, all right? More than they love to push policy. But what you're voting for ultimately is policy. And also keep in mind... Behind each president is an administration of about 5,000 people, okay? So you have to consider which group of 5,000 people do you want making decisions for your country? Because it's much, just much more than a, than a, a president, okay? So uh, I want to encourage you to vote for policies over personalities. This is why you must educate yourself when it comes to the policies you're voting for. If you don't know the policies behind either candidate, don't vote. Uh, you got to get educated. You can't just watch a, a commercial. We're getting bombarded with political commercials right now uh, and think, well, I'm going to vote because I saw this commercial. Educate yourself. It's not hard. Look at your screen time on your phone and then take some of that time and educate yourself on the policies. The policies I'm going to talk about today, I believe, are somewhat biblical in nature, okay? That's why I'm going to bring them up. I'm not bringing up every policy, but I'll bring up some. I'm probably going to anger both sides of the table, and that's fine. Maybe some will be more angry than others, but listen, at the end of the day, I still love you. I'm still your pastor. I, I hope and pray we can talk about politics and care for one another. 
So I'm going to talk about a few policies. First one uh, is abortion. I'm unapologetically pro-life. And when, we, when you read the scriptures, the scriptures is very clear. Uh, that's a life in there. That's a child that God created. Okay? If you study the scriptures at all, you cannot get around that. Psalm 139, for it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I've been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. The disappointing thing about this election is that we don't have a pro-life candidate on either side. And I believe there are only two options to vote for this presidency. If you, you choose a third option, you're essentially throwing your vote away. But we don't have a pro-life candidate. Uh, President Trump is for a 15-week abortion ban. So no abortions after 15 weeks. 95% of abortions take place before 15 weeks. And the other side, it's much worse. It is, if we're just being honest, there are zero restrictions. Meaning uh, uh, someone who's nine months pregnant can have an abortion. They, they, the other side goes so far as to even have an abortion clinic outside of their convention. That's wrong. And I will say, I know when it comes to this issue, it's very sensitive, very difficult. And if you are one of the uh, one in four women who've, who've had an abortion, uh, I, I'm not saying these things to shame you or any of that sort. I would say there is forgiveness and there is love found in Jesus Christ and we love you and we care for you. And maybe you know someone who's considering abortion. Friend, there are plenty of options out there to help them. Some folks just feel trapped. I can't afford this. I don't have the support that I need. There are plenty of options out there. My wife, Whitney, she works for a pro-life organization called Let Them Live. They have counselors. They have financial resources. They will help you. There's help out there. You don't have to look at that as an option. You don't have to look at abortion as an option. So I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed uh, in this respect on both sides of this coin with both parties. I will say, um, when it comes to policies, what we're voting for, we're also voting for judges. And I'm grateful. Uh, President Trump put some good judges in and Roe v. Wade was overturned. Now it becomes a state issue. And so we have a lot of issues to deal with on a local level. I am grateful for that. <clears throat> so that's another thing to consider when voting for uh, president is which judges do you think will have the better judgment in deciding things for your country? Isaiah 1, I will restore your judges to what they were at first and your advisors to what they were at start. Afterward, you will be called the righteous city, a faithful town. We need good judges on a federal level, on the appellate level, and on the supreme level. And so, again, maybe you don't like the personality of the person you're voting for, but you have to ask yourself, which one will appoint better judges? And I'm not here today to endorse a candidate as your pastor. I'm going to vote. I have my political leanings. And all I'm going to tell you to do, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm just going to ask you, who do you think will do a better job when it comes to appointing judges? Something to consider. Border security. I, I, I don't necessarily like when, 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 when people mis misrepresent, um, I, don't, I, don't I don't like when people misrepresent um, what, what God says in the Bible. As if God is, is okay with a, a wide open border. Um, if you read the Old Testament, borders are mentioned a lot. Uh, you look at the New Testament, Acts 17. For one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. It's not sinful to have, for, for nations to have borders. It's wise. It's important. Not sinful. But also, we do want to welcome the immigrants. So what do we do with that? Zechariah 7, do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the resident alien or the poor. Do not plot evil in your hearts against one another. 
So we should be welcoming to the immigrant. But there needs to be a process for this. To come in illegally is not the way to do it. Now, I understand there are, there are dangerous people who have, have crossed the border and crimes have been committed. I get that. I, I will say there's also another side of those trying to get into our country who do want a better life. The reason I know this is, you know, years ago, um, I was talking to our missionaries in Oaxaca, Mexico, the Hernandez family. And many people passed through there. And I'm talking to them, you know, about, hey, what, what's going on with with the, the movement of people there in Mexico. And they said, listen, most of these people are indeed fleeing terrible situations. And they view America as a place to have a better life. Why? Because America is the place to have a better life. It is the land of opportunity. And I get that. But they also agree this has to be done legally. So if you want to make an argument that we need to reform legal immigration, then I'd be willing to hear that, totally. But allowing a flood of people in illegally is not wise and not smart. Most of us are, at some point, our families were immigrants. And part of my family, the, the Caponetti side of, of my family, it comes from Sicily. My great-grandfather, Philip Caponetti, uh, they immigrated when he was, I don't know, like five or six. You remember how old he was, Matt? Peppel? He was four. So he was just a little kid when they immigrated from Sicily. And so I can't trace all my family back, you know, to their country of origin, but I, I do know part of us uh, were, were Italian. And so, um, but there's a legal way they went about that. And so make an argument for legal reform of the immigration uh, system that we have. Um, but it's dangerous to just allow an, an open border. But you have to ask yourself, ask yourself, who do you think would be better at securing the border and promoting national security? Ask yourself that question. So abortion, uh, the border, what we've talked about, we've talked about judges. Uh, the next would be Israel. Uh, in Genesis 12, God's speaking uh, about Abraham or to Abraham, and he says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. We believe it is a blessing to care for Israel. Now, it doesn't mean we endorse every single thing that Israel does as a nation, but they have a right to exist and a right to defend themselves. And we as a country should unapologetically support them. They are only democracy in the Middle East. They need our support. We should never cozy up with Israel's enemies. And unfortunately, the last four years, Iran has had billions of dollars unfrozen for them. And those billions of dollars has helped cause what's happening with Hezbollah and in Gaza. Which candidate is going to best support Israel? That's a question you have to ask yourself. How we feel so far? We're getting there, okay? <laughs> Next is religious liberty. Which candidate you think will best support religious liberty? And what I mean by this, would the government ever force something on you that would violate your faith? Anybody remember COVID? I wrote many religious exemptions for people because their work was telling them, you will get this vaccine or you will lose your job. We lived through that. That's wrong. It's wrong. And so I would write religious exemptions um, and they would take them to their work and say, listen, this is against my, my faith. And they were able to keep their jobs. They got very tense and serious for many of them. Would a, a, a baker be forced to bake a cake for something he doesn't support? They sure try that. 
Would doctors who are against abortion be forced to do so? It's quite possible. So would the government force you to do something or try to get you to do something that is against your faith? I remember uh, talking with the guy who does our T-shirts and um, this was years ago. Brandon, you probably remember it, where, where he got targeted by a group that was really, it was, they were, this group would target Christian businesses to try to force them to do things that would go in conflict to their beliefs. And this one it was uh, to make a bunch of pride shirts. And uh, our t-shirt guy, he's a Christian. He holds a biblical view of, of marriage and sexuality. And um, for him to say no on religious grounds, he was nervous that uh, he could be sued to oblivion, which is again was happening with the, the Baker issue was happening a lot there in Colorado at the time. And uh, thankfully, he, he had an out in, in not having to deal with this because uh, his T-shirt, uh, the, his printing capabilities was limited to like three colors or so, two, three or four colors, not enough to make all that they wanted to be made with rainbows and whatnot. Um, but this, they would target businesses who follow Christ. You have to ask yourself, which candidate is going to best support religious liberty? That you're going to be able to live out your faith without fear of coercion from the government to do something that you don't want to do. When it comes to the issue of biological sex, Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created him. Can you put that on the screen, please? It's not on there? I didn't put it in there? I failed this time. My apologies, Cam. Let's give it up for Cam, the slide guy. <laughs> your, dad, your dad failed earlier. He was covering for you, so anyway. <laughs> That's Genesis 127, church. God created us male and female. It, it, it's, it's wild to think that a controversial statement today is men can't become women and women can't become men. Uh, though that is controversial, and there's, there's certainly peer pressure from uh, society to say, hey, you know, there's more nuance to this, and so on and so forth. Now, this is pretty plain, okay? Um, and I would say there, there are folks who, who struggle in that area of their life. They do deserve our compassion, okay? They do deserve compassion, and they deserve to get some, some care for the issues that they're dealing with. They don't need affirmation in the illness that they have. And I believe, I'm not trying to sound crass or, or mean, I believe it is a, a, there's a mental illness of sorts that needs, needs help and care. And, but to affirm them in their situation is wrong. It, it would be just as wrong for me to go up to someone who's struggling with anorexia and say, man, you are fat. Because in their mind, they are. That's why they're starving themselves. They've lost grip on what's happening with reality. They deserve compassion and care, not affirmation. And yet, many in society are saying, no, if, you think you're, uh, if you're a man and you think you're a woman, then you are. But the problem is, that he, what is a woman? What are you identifying with? What objective standard are you identifying with? How do you transition to a woman if you don't know what you're transitioning to, if you can't define it? There has to be a definition, right? And, and so if a, a man thinks he's a woman, um, he's still a man. He just thinks he's a woman. And this is invading. Now, I, I know there are women who think they're men, but let's be honest, there are, are more men who think they're women uh, invading women's spaces than vice versa when it comes to your sports. Title IX essentially doesn't exist anymore. If you're not familiar with Title IX, it's supposed to protect women's sports. It's almost a thing of the past. Your restrooms, 
I gotta be honest with you. Um, thankfully, you know, most of the time we're going out places. You know, my wife goes in there with, with my daughter. But um, dads only make you second guess. Someone's in the bathroom. Might be a guy who thinks he's a woman. And just to sound, I mean, I don't know how to put this, but if I see someone like going into the restroom with my, my daughter, they're going to have to wait because they're not going in there with her. This is invading your everyday life. So Christians, if you decide not to vote, then you're just keeping your mouth shut and then you complain about these issues, but yet you do nothing about it. So if you don't vote, don't come crying to me about it. Recently in our prison system, a child rapist by the name of William McLean decided that he was a woman and they put him in a woman's prison. Don't believe me? You can look it up. I did jail ministry. I know what life is like for someone who's raped a child in prison. I talked to the inmates. So this guy thought that his way out, he's going to transition to a woman, and they put him in a, a woman's prison. Now, let me ask you a question. I know they're in prison, but they still have rights. Do those women have rights? So not be forced to bunk with a man who thinks he's a woman. So let me ask you, which candidate do you think will best protect biological sex? I'm not talking personalities. I'm not saying you have to like the person that you're voting for. Stop with that nonsense, okay? You've got to get beyond this surface level. I don't like this. I don't like that. Policies and administrations. Plain and simple. And then finally, the family. Which candidate do you think will best support the family? Psalm 127, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. And they are. Children are a blessing. I, was, I forget who I was talking to in our men's group. The most fun you'll have, at least I think, uh, some of the most fun you have isn't, uh, like when I was a kid, I thought, man, when I grow up, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play video games and um, eat junk food and live by myself. It's gonna be perfect. And to my nine-year-old self, that sounded pretty awesome. One of my favorite things to do, though, is those same video games, or, and you can fill in the blank with anything. I like video games, I like sports, I like that kind of stuff. But if you grew up liking something else, great. But one of my favorite things to do is sit down with my kids and play those same video games that I was playing when I was nine. They get to enjoy something, I get to show them something, they get in on it. And so we play some Zelda or Mario, you fill in the blank, we have fun together. Being dad's awesome. Challenging, but it's awesome. Which candidate will best support the family? Children don't belong to the state. They don't. Your child doesn't belong to the government. Though the government would love to teach your children things that you don't support. I, I will say, as a side note, if your child goes to a government school, you need to be heavily involved in what that government school is teaching. I'm not saying every government school in our area is a bad school. I'd say many are, but not all of them. And you should be aware of what they're teaching your child. It should be basic education stuff. I don't, personally, I don't think the government has any right or any, any should have any room to teach your children anything about sex none that's your job parents and if you're not doing that then shame on you and yes i, I know that they'll throw around well book bans and this kind of stuff listen 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 there should be no adult material for children to look at even if it's a children's book available 
in your children's school. It shouldn't exist. It shouldn't happen. You're, the teachers should not be talking to your children about that topic at all. And if your teacher, if your child's teacher does, then you better raise hell. And I mean that. You better cause problems with that. If there's a pride flag in your child's classroom, that's a problem. The only flag that should be there is an American one. Society would love to raise your children. <clears throat> they would love it. They would love to indoctrinate your child in their beliefs. Every child's indoctrinated. Okay, I know it has like this weird negative connotation. I'm going to indoctrinate my children. I want to, I'm going to teach them what they need to know. Okay, that's, that's my job and what's the job? That's our job. Government would love to do that for you. Society would love to do that for you. There's a reason they're having a drag queens read at a library to little kids. And if you do that, you're, you're a bad parent. There's a reason that many of the, the cartoon programming for your children has become somewhat sexual in nature in that respect. <clears throat> when it comes to the idea of trans kids, <clears throat> Children don't have the capacity to make those kinds of decisions. They don't. If your 12-year-old comes, your 12-year-old son comes and says he's a girl, no, you're not. It's getting scary now, ch church. In California, if parents can lose custody of their children if they don't, or if they resist gender transition for their child. In California, a child can be taken out of a home. You don't have to take my word for it, okay? Look it up yourself, inform yourself. In Minnesota, they just passed the trans refuge law. Do you know what that means? Have you heard of it? If you haven't, educate yourself. Let's say your teenage daughter thinks she's a guy and you live in the state next and she's got relatives in Minnesota. She can go to Minnesota, stay with her aunt. And typically, if your, your child left and went with even a family member and there was some tension there, they're going to send the child back to you. It, it, the, the trans refuge law would say, okay, your 16-year-old can go over there and you have no more rights. They will take your child away from you. Don't take my word for it. Do your homework. Educate yourself. Children do not have the capacity to make such decisions. Furthermore, that's a sign that there's some issues that they have and they need to be addressed and they need to have compassion. And don't give me this nonsense about puberty blockers and it pauses puberty as if it's some VHS from 1993. That's not how your body works. There's a reason in, U in the UK, which is more crazy in some respects than even over here, in the UK, they banned all puberty blockers for children. Why do they do that? Because it destroys their body. Which candidate do you think will best support the family? Again, I don't care if you like them. Stop making likability the litmus test for whether or not you're going to vote for someone. And newsflash, you could say it's always been the, the choice between the lesser of two evils because these are flawed human beings. No matter who you voted for in the past, they're flawed. You vote for policies and you vote for administrations. Which one do you think is going to do the best when it comes to policy? So Christians, I implore you, vote vote. Vote early. Sometime next week, go and vote. Won't take you long. I would encourage you to pray. Be prayerful about your decision. 
And I get, after the election is over, some people are going to be disappointed. <laughs> Pick your side. There's going to be disappointed people out there. There's going to be angry people out there. And if it doesn't go the way that you want it to go, and you're a Christian, I want you to keep something in mind. You're active in the political process, so you did your duty. Your political party doesn't have to be in power for you to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, our mission is greater than a political mission. I am not relying on the government, whether Republican or Democrat, to spread the gospel. That is our job. In fact, you could make an argument that Christianity thrives in governments that are against them. Don't believe me? Look at China. The fastest growth of the Christian church is in China, where their faith is illegal, yet it explodes. So while we should be responsible and we should vote, I'm not going to freak out either way. At the end of the day, I know who the King of Kings is. I know who the Prince of Peace is. I know my purpose on this planet. I know what my mission is. And if the election doesn't go the way I vote, okay. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get up the next day and I'm going to share Jesus. We're one in Jesus Christ, church. We're a diverse group of people. We have different likes. We have different dislikes. We have different theological agreements and disagreements. And yes, we have different political viewpoints. At the end of the day, I love you. I love this church. We are one in Christ. You don't have to agree with me, and I don't have to agree with you. We won't let politics get us off of our mission. Our mission is greater than that. But you should have an influence. You should use your influence as a Christian to be active in the political process. Godly people need to have a part in this, or else you're resolving yourself to having godless people be in control. And so Christians vote. I am not going to ask you who you vote for. We're not going to have this little test for church, you know? Because at the end of the day, we're, we're followers of Christ. We're one in Christ. Let's pray. Friend, take a moment. <clears throat> I want you to pray for, for both candidates. I don't want to pray for that candidate. Good, that means you need to pray for him. <laughs> take a moment to pray for him. I'm not saying by praying for him you have to vote for him, but you do need to pray. As you're praying, pray for their safety. It's definitely... Uh, a turbulent uh, election. <clears throat> Almighty God, Lord, I, I come to you today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the unity that we have in Jesus Christ that usurps any other issue that we may be facing. Lord, we are one in Christ. We know what our mission is. We know why we're here. And I know, Lord, uh, within this body of believers, there's going to be disagreement when it comes to the issues I shared today. I pray that we're mature enough in Christ to be able to disagree and yet love one another. This is not a Republican church. It's not a Democrat church. This is the church of Jesus Christ. I pray for Christians to be involved in the political process, that they not sit it out. We have this beautiful freedom. And with that freedom comes great responsibility to be active in this political process. Lord, we pray for the safety of both candidates, for Kamala Harris and for Donald Trump. God, we pray for our country. We pray for the American people. It's a very tense time, Lord. I, I pray for us as, as believers to be a, a voice of reason in the midst of this tense time. Lord, I pray for Christians to educate themselves and, and vote for the candidate they, they think would best uh, represent the policies that we talked about today. Ultimately, Lord, at the end of the day, we know what our mission is, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. 
Our hope, ultimately, Lord, is it's not in a political party. It is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save our nation. So help us to keep on mission in the midst of all this. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing before we're dismissed. Thank you.